Qualichem, supporting the water treatment community since 1990. At Qualichem, we say the blender matters. And here are some things that matter at Qualichem. An unparalleled support staff. We have three certified water technologists on staff to support your technical needs. This means you get the expertise you need from someone who has walked in your shoes. With one of the strongest support staffs in the industry, Qualichem offers support in technical, sales, application, and lab support. To find out more about Qualichem, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash Qualichem. Once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash Qualichem. At Qualichem, we know the blender matters. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. This is an interesting episode because a lot of people have asked for this, and we've actually already done an episode like this. So more about that a little bit later. I am so excited because it is almost May. We're at the end of April. And May is when the mastermind, the Rising Tide Mastermind, gets together for our live event. And that's going to be May 23rd through 25th. And we have over 60 members in the mastermind. We've got over six groups. We've got a waiting list for a seventh group. I'm sure we're going to have 10 groups before long. And it has just become such an amazing community. Now, four years ago when I started the Mastermind, I was hoping we'd get a few like-minded people together that wanted to share ideas and help each other with issues. And it has just become, beyond my wildest dreams, successful. And that is because of the people within the mastermind. So they see the value of joining the mastermind, but then once they become part of the mastermind and they plug in, it is just amazing at how tight these groups are and how their sole purpose is to help get each other further faster while they're having more fun with each other. And we meet every week on a Zoom call, but then once a year, we all get together here in Atlanta, Georgia. And folks, that is just around the corner. I am so excited. This will be the third Mastermind event that we have had. And we get together, and it's so great because now we're in person. And we get to really enjoy each other's company. We have speakers, we have workshops, we have activities, and by the time all of that's over, everybody's sad to go home. You always know it's a good event when people are sad to leave, and then they cannot wait to get back and do some of the things that we talked about in the live event at their companies and in their families. Folks, we are making sure that we are all going further, faster, and having more fun while we're doing that. And one of the things we are doing at this live event is every member is giving a TED Talk. You probably know what a TED Talk is. You've probably listened to a few. And a TED is very informative, and it's got a format. And we have all read the book TED Talks by Chris Anderson. We've seen examples that Chris has given us of TED Talks, and now we are writing our own TED Talk, and we are going to be giving each other feedback to help them with that TED Talk. And at the very end of all of the TED Talks, once everybody has gone, we are going to nominate our own members to the TED stage. So who knows? Maybe we will get a couple of the Rising Tide Mastermind members on the TED stage. And I'll tell you, a lot of people are a little nervous. They're having to speak in front of others. And I'm going to say, whenever you have that feeling inside you that you're getting a little bit nervous, stay with whatever you're doing because that means you are outside your comfort zone. And if all you do is stay within your comfort zone, well, you're not growing. And I promise that when you get that little nervous, tingly feeling, it means you are on the outside walls of your comfort zone. And once you push past that, you now have a bigger comfort zone. You've now expanded the things that you are comfortable with. And if you stay on that outer wall of that comfort zone and you keep pushing yourself, 
you will be amazed at the things that you will be able to accomplish. A lot of times we are our own worst critic. We stand in our own way, and that is your body's way of letting you know that you are growing. So please never run from that feeling. Run towards it, embrace it, and push through it. I know we're all going to do that May 23rd through 25th at the live event. And Nation, I always talk about the mastermind. I am a huge fan of the mastermind. I have been helped so much by the mastermind, and so many people have been helped within the mastermind. Maybe the mastermind is something that you need to consider. And I say all the time, maybe that this mastermind is not the right one for you, but maybe there is one out there. Life is hard. Life is lonely. There's no reason for that. You can do life together with other people and they will help you get further faster while you're having more fun. So if you want to find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind. And if it sounds like something you want to learn more about, maybe you and I can have a conversation to find out what the next step may be. Nation, life is short. Life is lonely. Make sure you're doing life right. Find some people to do life with. It makes it so much better. Well, some other things that might make your life better is getting out there with all the different events that we have in the industrial water treatment community and meet new people, learn new things. So here are a couple of things that you might want to check out. And of course, as always, we have all of these things and more on our show events page. So you can go to scalinguph2o.com, navigate over to the events page where we have everything water treatment related, all conferences and expos are all listed out by date. And all you simply have to do is click and it will even put a calendar invite in your own calendar and it will take you to the registration page so you can do everything you need from one source, scalinguph2o.com. So here are a few things. The Odors and Air Pollutants 2023 conference is taking place in Charlotte, North Carolina, May 16th through 19th. This is put on by the Water Environment Federation. This conference is all about learning more about about the ABCs of odor control. So if this is a field that you are in and you want to learn more about and have a community to help you do it, we'll have all that information on our show events page. The American Water Works Association is hosting their ACE 23 conference June 11th through 14th in Toronto, Canada. ACE is where the water community comes together to learn, connect, and inspire to solve global water challenges. We'll have this information and more at scalinguph2o.com over on our events page. And then finally, StormCon 2023 is taking place in Dallas, Texas, August 28th through 30th. This is the stormwater industry's premier event meant to connect stormwater managers, erosion control specialists, and engineers from all over the world. At StormCon, you will get more eyes on your products and services, and you will get the answers that you need making sure that you get an ROI on your exhibiting investment. So maybe you have something that you want to exhibit. This is the place for you to do that. Maybe you have something that you want to learn about the stormwater industry. We're going to have information about this on our show events page. So be sure to go over there. Nation, today we have an encore episode, and this episode was originally aired on March 1st, 2019, episode 75, entitled The One That's All About Corrosion Coupons. And I remember this day, I remember before I wrote this episode, I was doing corrosion coupons. And some of you may or may not know, Several years ago, I just was not happy with how corrosion coupons were being reported to us. I was getting numbers back and I wasn't getting a lot of data to really help us hone in on improving our programs. So I did what anybody that probably wasn't thinking clearly would do and I bought everything we needed to have a metallurgical lab. Well, for anybody that's purchased this equipment, you know that this is not a cheap endeavor. 
So I don't know what I was thinking, but we bought all this equipment and uh, we started doing our own corrosion coupons and we started doing corrosion coupons for other AWT members. And we started looking at what the coupon was actually telling us and not just a number, but what were we learning from the coupon? And we were able to make great adjustments to our program. Our technicians here at our company actually got more data from the corrosion coupons. And then when we were sharing that with AWT members, they started sharing that with other people. And now we've got a pretty good business in our metallurgical lab. So I guess it was a good thing. But let me say, whenever you're not getting something that you need, whether you decide to take issues in your own hands or you decide to go to another vendor, another provider, I think it's important that whenever you run a test or do a coupon study or whatever it is, you ask yourself, what are you going to do with the results once you get them? And so many of us just simply hang corrosion coupons in a system and we really don't think about it. Maybe we look at the number, maybe we do something with it, but folks, everything that we do, every test that we run, we have something that we can gain from that information. I think if we start at where we end, we will actually do a better job at starting. So with all of that, when I started this episode, I saw a corrosion coupon that got mailed into our office, to our metallurgical lab, and it was bent up. It wasn't put away correctly. It had rusted in transit, and I just felt sorry for it. So the whole premise of this episode was I was trying to help that poor little corrosion coupon guy that was sitting on my desk that was not shown any love whatsoever. I said, buddy, I'm going to tell your story. So here is episode 75, remastered, digitally replayed in THX Dolby, I don't know, whatever. Here's the episode, folks. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast for water treaters, by water treaters, where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, Scaling Up Nation, Trace Blackmore here, your host for Scaling Up H2O. And folks, I have received so many questions around this one topic that I thought it would be a good idea to do an entire show on this topic. Now, I know what you're thinking. What the heck is this topic? So I'm going to relieve the suspense. I have received so many questions around corrosion coupons. Corrosion coupons are one of those things that we kind of use because people say we have to use them, but many of us don't understand what corrosion coupons are, the importance of them, and especially what to do with them when you get the results. Folks, I know this because I live this. Many, many years ago, I remember I was told to use corrosion coupons by my father, and I really didn't know why. I just put them in the system, and we got some results, and he did something with them, and I really didn't know. So I started asking, and because I started asking these questions, I learned that corrosion coupons are one of the most cost-effective, easy tools for us water treatment folk to use that gives us so much information, allowing us to make the system that we are treating better. So I'm going to try to share with you what I've learned over the past 20 plus years about corrosion coupons and the experiences that I've had with corrosion coupons. So you too will see that they are a valuable tool. Now, several years ago, when I started Blackmore Enterprises, I was using corrosion coupons because I was taught to use corrosion coupons, and I was sending them off to a lab, and then I would get a number back. And folks, that number, it told me something, but there's so much more in the corrosion coupon analysis that can really tell the professional water treater 
how they can make that system better. And a number just doesn't do that. So it was at that point that I decided that I wanted my own metallurgical lab so we could start analyzing corrosion coupons. And when we did that, we were then able to see firsthand the corrosion coupons and start developing why things happen so we could now take the corrosion coupon data and immediately apply that to the system. So I'm going to try to share some of that with you today. But if you're listening to this show and you're wondering what the heck is a corrosion coupon and you're a water treater, I want to bring you along through this story because you need to be using corrosion coupons too. So quite simply, corrosion coupons are little pieces of metal and they can be any metal. I did have a question come up. Are the only types of metals you can get in corrosion coupons, mild steel and copper? No, there are literally thousands of alloys that you can get corrosion coupons out of. If they build a piece of equipment out of a certain type of metal, I promise you can find that same alloy in a corrosion coupon. So quite simply, corrosion coupons are these little slips of metal that we put into a system and they mimic the same type of metal that we have within the system. Now the premise is that if we put the same type of metal that the system has in the system, to analyze, we can figure out what the corrosion rates are, and then we can compare that to see if we are doing, or if the system is doing, acceptable or not acceptable as far as corrosion rates. Now, do you use corrosion coupons in all systems? Well, if you can, why not? So some people will ask, you know, I've got a chiller or I've got this expensive piece of equipment and I'm using corrosion coupons in that, but then in a closed loop system, I don't use corrosion coupons in. Well, folks, if you are treating the water within a system that has metal in it, I'm pretty sure that's every system. If you're not using corrosion coupons, your default is whatever that expensive piece of equipment is that you're treating, that now has become your corrosion coupon. So when that develops a problem, that's your alert that there is a problem in the system. Otherwise, you could use a corrosion coupon, and a corrosion coupon is a lot cheaper than that expensive piece of equipment that you are treating And on a more proactive basis, you can now see what the corrosion rates are within the system. And again, like I said, see if those are acceptable or not acceptable. The great things about corrosion coupons is they're a shorter interval than whenever that equipment inspection is. So you can make slight adjustments to your program and see if you're increasing or decreasing the effectiveness of the system. Corrosion coupons are very simple. They are pre-weighed to the 10,000th of a gram. Folks, if you're wondering, that is four places after the decimal. So we really want to zero down on exactly what the weight is when we start. We then let that stay in the system for a certain amount of time. We're going to talk about that in a moment and then we clean them up and then we weigh them. And then based on what the results are, we're going to change our program or we're going to keep doing the exact same program because now we have data from the corrosion coupons. So for those of you that just started listening have no idea what a corrosion coupon is, I hope now you can see that it is the most economical way that you can monitor corrosion rates within the system so you can pro actively adjust your program based on the results of those corrosion coupons. Corrosion coupons come in so many different shapes, sizes, alloys, you name it, you can find a corrosion coupon out there. In fact, I'm looking at a catalog where I get most of my corrosion coupons and it's almost an inch thick and all it is is just a listing of all the different corrosion coupons that are available out there and I am sure that that is an abbreviated version. Now, chances are if you're a water treater like I am, you probably have a couple of go-to corrosion coupons that your company already has established. 
already have inventoried and you can just simply ask for them and put them in your customer systems. So you're going to have basically two primary metals that you are going to use, but if there is a different metal in the system, that is what you need to measure. We'll get into identifying the different types of corrosion coupons as we move forward. But when the coupon is weighed and everything is said and done, it is measured in a unit called mils per year. Mils per year, quite simply put, is one thousandth of an inch. So if you want to think of that in these terms, a heat exchanger, let's say the metal in the heat exchanger is one tenth of an inch thick. If you have a corrosion rate of 10 mils per year, it's going to take 10 years to penetrate the walls of that heat exchanger. Now, that's not exactly true, and I can throw a bunch of things in there to say whether that will work or not. But for our definition, that's how we're going to look at that. So it's the removal of the metal metal that we are trying to protect in the system, and it's the rate in which it is being removed. When you get a corrosion coupon, it is going to come in an envelope, probably a brown paper envelope. And you're going to look at this and you're going to say, there is nothing special about this envelope. But actually there is. One, it houses your corrosion coupon. It's got some data on it, but it's also a treated piece of paper. The envelope is treated with what we call VCIs volatilizing corrosion inhibitors and what their purpose is and why they treat this envelope with these corrosion inhibitors is we don't want the corrosion coupon to start corroding in transit. We don't want it to start corroding when it's sitting on the shelf getting ready to be used. We only want it to start corroding when we put it in the system. So if you do not have these types of envelopes, please realize that your corrosion coupons will start corroding before they're in the system. Now, the coupons will become marked and it will have a serial number on them. They're stamped right into the corrosion coupon and then the envelope also has that same serial number along with the envelope, has the original weight. Now, think about that. If we put a corrosion coupon in the system and it wasn't identified and then we bring it back to the lab and we've got 100 coupons that we've got to try to identify, we have to use the serial number in order to identify them. So we have to have the serial number and then we have to have the starting weight. Other water treaters have sent corrosion coupons to me without the starting weight, and then they get upset that I can't weigh them. Well, I can give you a final weight, but if I don't know what the starting weight is, I can't tell you how much metal loss between A and B there were, and I can't do my math then, and I can't get you a number. So you have to make sure when you have these envelopes that you take care of them, you store them properly. And what I mean by that is you do not lose them. You will also have the alloy number, and there are different types of alloys, as I mentioned. So this will have the specific alloy that's there, and then it will have the part number itself. And by the part number, like I said earlier, you're going to have a specific length and width and depth of the coupon. You're going to have a specific hole size. All of that is realized in that part number. So once you know which part number that you need, you can then simply just keep ordering those over and over and over again from your favorite supplier. Most of these envelopes are stamped with information that the more information that you put on that envelope, the better somebody like me who's analyzing these coupons can help you with. And they want to know the type of chemicals that you're using in the system. They want to know the date in and the date out. I can't tell you how many times I have received corrosion coupons that did not have this mark. Folks, corrosion coupons have a couple of things that we measure. One, it's the weight over a specific amount of time. So how much metal is lost from the beginning date to the ending date? If we don't have the starting weight and we don't have the date that that coupon was put into the system and the date that that coupon was taken out of the system, we simply can't measure the coupon. Now I can tell you how much the coupon weighs because that is our final step in the lab, but that's all I can tell you and that's not enough data and that is a useless coupon. So if they 
there is information that they're asking for on that corrosion coupon envelope, the more that you can fill out, the better that somebody like myself can help you. Folks, there are standards that tell us what to do with corrosion coupons. And specifically, there are two standards, ASTM G1 and G4. Now, G4 tells us how to actually test corrosion coupons in the field, what to do with them, how to install them, all of that stuff. The G1 tells the lab what to do when they get those back. So if you're interested in that, I'm sure you can find those online. And NACE even has some practice procedures. There are a couple of other uh, ASTM guidelines that you can use if you're uh, out using a specific type of coupon in a specific type of industry. But the two I mentioned, the G1 and the G4 ASTM are the ones that we water traders use most in the corrosion coupons that we use. When you install the corrosion coupon, ideally you wanna put these in a rack that is specifically designed for the corrosion coupon. And when you look up the standards that I just mentioned, it says the order in which the coupons need to go in. It says the orientation that the coupons need to go in. It says the amount of flow. All of that information is from those documents, but I do realize that many of us have not read those documents. So I'm gonna to try to explain uh, a real general approach to what those documents say. So as far as the corrosion coupons, I'm not gonna get into how far apart the corrosion coupons need to be and the thickness of the diameter of pipe and then how far the corrosion coupon needs to be mounted within that pipe. Like I said, work with a manufacturer that you're getting a lot of your pumps and controllers with now. I am sure that they have corrosion coupon holders, but when what they've done, they've manufactured these so you will get the same results as we were just referring to in the G4. So things that they're gonna be doing is they're gonna make sure that we have flow between three to five feet per second, and then that we have a corrosion coupon rack that is attacked from the bottom. Folks, I've seen so many orientations of corrosion coupon holders and just realize, will you get a result if you don't put a corrosion coupon holder in correctly or if you don't even use a corrosion coupon holder? Yes, you will get a result, but the closer that you can get to these standards, the more variables you're gonna be taking out of the equation. And we already have so many variables in our systems that if we can eliminate one or two or three or four, we're gonna be that much better with the data that we are collecting. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the water comes up from the bottom and out through the top. So when you're orienting your corrosion coupon holder, that's how you wanna do that. And if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense because the reason we do that is we wanna purge all the air out of it. Then the corrosion coupon is put on a holder. And folks, I have seen holders made out of metal. Just think about that. If we have a metal coupon and a dissimilar metal holder, well, folks, we've got electrolysis going on right there. That is not acceptable. So corrosion coupon holders are normally made out of plastic. Definitely the little screw and nut that holds them in should always be plastic. But like I've said, I've seen the corrosion coupon holder come in. It was all PVC. The holder was, the rack was, and then the nut and the bolt was actually a galvanized piece of metal. Folks, you can't do that. So just, just use common sense with that. So when you put them into the system, you wanna make sure that they are aligned properly. If they are not perfectly straight, they can touch the side of the pipes. And I gotta tell you, when I see a weird corrosion pattern, a weird wear pattern, when they come into the lab, I can tell that those corrosion coupons were set up against the sidewall of that pipe and it doesn't allow for a good result. So make sure you get those perfectly square and those coupons need to be oriented perfectly straight up and down, not on the side. And if you think about that, that makes sense too, because if we lose flow in the system and we have a flat side where things can settle on, that can change our corrosion rate. So we wanna make sure that those are straight up and down. Now there's a lot of confusion with corrosion coupons about what corrosion coupon to put first. And here is 
the way you should put four different metals in a corrosion coupon, starting from the bottom. And again, flows coming from the bottom, going through the corrosion coupon rack, exiting through the top. So you would start with aluminum. You would start with uh, mild steel. You would then put your copper in. And then finally, you would put your stainless steel. Now, for most of you, that's all you needed to know. And you're probably just going to be using mild steel and then copper. So you would put the mild steel in first. The flow would hit that, go up, hit the copper, and then it would go out of the system. And you're probably happy just knowing that information. Now, me, I like to know more information about that. And if you are going to take the certified water technologist examination, this is something that you need to know. One, you need to know that there is a thing out there called the galvanic series. And the galvanic series tells us how metal will corrode. Now, the lower down in the galvanic series, it says it's more noble meaning that it is not as likely to corrode as a metal that is above it. Now, the term we give to the metals on top is we say that it's less noble or more active. So hopefully that makes sense. The higher the metal is, the more active it is, and we call that less noble. The metals that are on the bottom, below the metals we just talked about, those are going to be more noble or less active. Now, the way I like to remember this is Game of Thrones. And Game of Thrones is probably the most talked about show on this show. So many people said that they watched it when I've interviewed them, and definitely I watch it as well. Well, if you look at it and you look at nobility, all the people that are noble, the royals, all that sort of stuff, they're not doing any of the work. They are sending their people out there to do the work. So I I remember that as more noble means less active because the more noble you are, you're probably going to get somebody that works under you. Of course, I'm thinking Game of Thrones context to go out and do the work. So the person that comes to mind with this is Darinus Targaryen. Can you just imagine her business card? Now, she's the blonde that's on the show, and she has the dragons and all that stuff. So I'm going to try to get this right. And for those of you that don't watch the show, I'm sure this is totally useless for you. But I'm going to try to do this for the fans out there. So here's her complete title. A stormborn of the House of Targaryen, first of her name, the Unburnt, Queen of the Andals and First of Men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, Breaker of Chains, and Mother of Dragons. How would you want that on your business card? Well, folks, if you just think about nobility, and nobility probably has other things or other people working for them, that's how I remember more noble, less work, least noble, more work. All that said to say is that's how we put the corrosion coupons in the system. However, we do it in the line of flow, so it's kind of reversed. So that's where a lot of people make mistakes. Now, if you put a copper coupon in front of a mild steel coupon, what will happen is it will look like you have two copper coupons when you take them out of that duration. So in order to prevent that, you wanna put the most noble metal last because again, it's through the line of flow, which flips the whole thing upside down. I don't know if I kept everybody up with that, so, but that's how I remember it, and that's why they're organized. Another question I get quite a bit is how long should I keep corrosion coupons in the system? And folks, this is really up to you. You can keep corrosion coupons in as long or as short of a time as you want, but you need to realize this. The longer the corrosion coupons are in the system, the more that they are going to mimic the system. Now, here's what I mean by that. The shorter the corrosion coupons are in the system, the more aggressive that system water is going to be to that corrosion corrosion coupon. Because think about it, our job is to corrode the metal in a way where we slow down the corrosion of that metal. We call that process passivation. If we put a brand new raw corrosion coupon in that system, it does not have the benefit of having that passive coating on that, that passivation. 
So we are going to get a more rapid corrosion rate in the first couple of days of that coupon. Now, if we only have that coupon in there for 30 days, a lot of those 30 days is going to be indicative of that higher corrosion rate. So if you are only using 30-day coupons, expect your corrosion rates to be a little bit higher than they actually are in the system. So how long can you leave corrosion coupons in the system? Well, folks, you can leave them in as long as you want to. You just have to make sure that you know the original date that you put those in there and we can run that calculation. Again, the longer that they are in there, the more indicative they're going to be to the system that you're trying to gauge the corrosion rates for. Now, typically, we'll see timelines of 30, 60, 90, 120, yearly coupons, things such as that. And we're talking about corrosion coupons and anything that we're trying to improve a program, the more data sets that we have, the more opportunities we have to change the program. So here's what I like to do. I like to do corrosion coupon racks that will allow me to put two of the same types of metal in there. So let's say I'm just doing mild steel and copper. I will have two mild steels, two coppers, and on the very first time that I install those in the system, I'm going to put two mild steels and two coppers in that corrosion coupon rack. I'm then going to come back in 30 days and I'm going to remove one mild steel and one copper, and that now is a 30-day exposure. I'm going to replace those two that I just took out with, again, mild steel and copper, and then the next 30 days, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove that set that I put in originally, but now it's been in the system for 60 days and replace those, and now every 30 days, I now have 60 day results. So that gets me a little bit more accurate and I get a whole bunch of data points with that. Again, the more data points that we get that are accurate within the system, the better we can use these corrosion coupons to change our program and make our, at least verify that our program is working properly. Now, let's say it's been 60 days or 30 days or whatever, how many days you want to leave the corrosion coupons in the system, and now it's time to take them out. And I didn't mention this before, but when you handle a corrosion coupon, you want to make sure you're gloved. Just the small amount of oils that are on your fingers will change how that corrosion coupon will interface with that water. And I can't tell you how many corrosion coupons that I've received from water treaters in my lab that I can see your perfect thumbprint on there. Well, folks, that's not a good exposure to the water on the entire corrosion coupon surface. So those aren't good coupons. And the reason that those happen is because they did not glove themselves and those oils transferred from their thumb to the corrosion coupon. So when you take the corrosion coupon out, you also want to make sure that you're gloved. Now, here's a step that a lot of people miss that I can tell when I get those back in my lab, but there's nothing I can do about it. A lot of people put wet corrosion coupons in that VCI envelope, that brown envelope that the corrosion coupons came in originally. Don't do this because all that moisture will continue to corrode the coupon even though it's out of the system. And when we get it back at the lab, we can't tell if that corrosion took place in the system or when it was in the envelope. So real simple, you can take a paper towel, and you can simply just dry it off and only put dry coupons in that envelope. Now that you have that dry coupon that you did not touch in the envelope, take a piece of scotch tape and seal up the entire back side of that envelope. And that will mean that there is no air exposure, specifically no moist air exposure that can get into that envelope where it will continue to corrode that corrosion coupon. That's been a big issue of late and what a lot of the manufacturers have started doing because we would get corrosion coupons that we just bought straight from the factory and it would have signs of corrosion on them. They're actually now starting to wrap the corrosion coupons in special VCI paper and then putting those into the envelopes that are impregnated with the volatile corrosion inhibitor, the VCI compound. 
Now, if you did not fill out all of the information on the envelope, now is your opportunity to do that. Again, I need to know, or whoever's analyzing it needs to know what the install date was of that corrosion coupon and what the date was that you took that out. That has to be on there. We have to have the initial starting weight and then anything else that you want to share on that envelope, that will give us more information to analyze that corrosion coupon. After the exposure period is done with the corrosion coupons, that means you put them in the system, you label the envelope, you've taken them out the system, you finish labeling the envelope, and now you send them off to a lab and somebody like me gets them. Here's what happens when they go into a lab. So when we get them, we catalog everything. So whatever you send us, we make sure that we take good notes on and we note that if they are urgent or just regular coupon runs, and if they're urgent, it means we're going to put those ahead of everything that we do. If they're just regular coupon runs, then we're going to run those the next time we run all the coupons in our lab. So when we start to run the coupons, that procedure is we photograph everything. So we photograph the front and the back of the envelopes they came in. If you sent any paperwork in, we go ahead and copy that. And then we take pictures of the corrosion coupons themselves, front and back, before before they're cleaned. All the same types of metals then go into a cleaning process. So all the coppers go through the same batch together. All the mild steels go through the same process together. So we separate those out. And then there's a two-step cleaning process that we do. One, we've got to get all the organics off first. Now the G1 standard that I mentioned earlier, it tells you how to do all of this. So we get all the organics off by putting a cleaner into the flask that we're using. We put that into an ultrasonic cleaner and we add a certain amount of heat to it based on that standard for a certain amount of time based on that standard. And then we rinse those off and then we put those coupons now that we've got all the organics off of them in an inhibited acid. And what that inhibited acid is meant to do is to clean off all the corrosion byproducts during the exposure period that took place on that coupon. So now we've removed all the byproducts and we just have bare metal on those coupons. Now it's very specific in how we do that because we don't wanna remove more metal than we have to. We just wanna get the byproducts off. Once we get it to that stage, we then dry them, I set them all out flat on our bench, and then we have to use the envelopes that you gave us to identify the serial number to the coupon, and then we start weighing each coupon, again, down to the 10,000th of a gram. That's very, very specific. And of course, that's not your ordinary scale. These are special metallurgical scales. And then once that's done, we take a final picture of what that coupon looks like front and back after it's cleaned. And then we start doing math we do the equation to figure out how many mils per year was lost during that exposure time. And again, mils per year is one thousandths of one inch. And then we go ahead and write our reports. And if it's a regular HVAC cooling tower or a process cooling tower, chiller or closed loop system, something like that, the Association of Water Technologies has a standard guideline that they have put into the marketplace to say this is what is acceptable for mild steel and copper. And I will make sure to have that on my show notes page so you can see exactly what that is. But I do wanna explain a little bit about how the analysis works. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go into one of the items on the acceptable, non-acceptable list, those standards that I was talking about. So let's talk about mild steel in an evaporative water type system. So anything less than one mil per year is considered excellent. Anything that's less than three, but greater than one, of course, would be considered very good. And that goes all the way up to anything that's greater than 10 mils per year is unacceptable. And there's a good range, a fair range, and a poor range in between that. So a lot of times I will weigh a corrosion coupon and let's say it will come back as good. And that would be a 3.1 mils per year. 
Well, now let's say that corrosion coupon is pitted. Well, even though it weighed to where it said it was good, pitting is never good, pitting is never acceptable. So when you look at the rates on what is acceptable and what is not, you have to remember that pitting is never acceptable. Now here's what pitting is. Here's how I like to define pitting. Uh, to go back, what general corrosion is, it's the only acceptable corrosion that we can have within our systems. And what that means is that all of the corrosion is taking place evenly over the entire metal surface. That's what these standards are referring to. A pit means a localized point on that piece of metal where the entire potential for that entire surface is taking place in that one little pinpoint and that's called pitting. If you see pitting of any kind, it is not acceptable. And typically there is a reason for pitting. It might be how the coupon has been installed. It could be a flow issue. It could be a water treatment issue, but pitting is a sign that something is going on in the system. And I wanna make sure that the Scaling Up Nation realizes that even though you might get back a report that says a corrosion coupon is good or better, it is never good or better if it has a pit in it. A pit is always a fail. So once all that is done in the lab, the person that sent it in will receive a report, and now you've got to take that to the customer and explain to them what you now know about corrosion coupons. Now, the first thing that people want to assume is that whatever corrosion has taken place on that corrosion coupon is uniform through the entire system. And folks, what I said at the top of the show, that is not true. The corrosion you are measuring is the corrosion on that coupon. So that's why you want to try to mimic that G4 standard as much as you possibly can. And the easiest way to do that is to buy a pre-manufactured corrosion coupon holder and use it and install it properly. Just buying that and utilizing that properly alone will eliminate five variables that could play havoc with your corrosion coupons. So now you have to look at things where is it a issue with the operation of the system or is it an issue with my actual water treatment program or both? And then you need to talk with a customer and if there's never any flow on a particular system, now we have all these systems here in Atlanta where they build out all these redundancies and they just run one chiller and then they'll open up a chiller and they'll say, this chiller looks horrible. Your products are not working properly to keep the corrosion down within this chiller. And I'll look at them and I'll say, you're exactly right. We don't have magic products, Mr. Customer. They're not going to go into a system that's not running. You have to run the system in order for our products to actually go in there. And by the way, we get a lot of calls from customers that don't understand that. So you want to make sure that the systems are running because it is impossible to treat a system that is not. But you're looking at all these things and now you're going to apply the data that you got from that corrosion coupon to your system, making a change. And then in your next exposure rate on your next series of corrosion coupons, you will be able to see what type of an effect you had on that system. Again, I look at corrosion coupons as a very inexpensive proactive approach for us to get more data about the system that we are treating. I will urge each and every water treater out there that if you are not using corrosion coupons to please consider to start using that because again, the only way you are going to know that a problem is coming is once a problem is there. There's no proactivity if you're not periodically looking at what your corrosion rates are. Now, a lot of people ask me, do I prefer corrosion coupons or do I prefer the electronic corrosion coupon monitors? And of course, the more data sets that you get, the better it is. 
but those are expensive. And the only name I can think of is Corator. That's a name brand. And the actual systems itself have a, a generic name. And, and I'm sure I'm going to get a bunch of calls and write-ins because I can't think of it right now. But whatever that is, what it does, it every so many seconds, it takes a reading and calculates that into mils per year. So you can see hundreds, if not thousands of data sets over a day's time. So a lot of times those could be overkill in a system that's working well. Where I really like to use that is where we can do something with it. So maybe we're trying a new inhibitor or maybe we're trying a new biocide and every time that feeds, we can now get real time data to what happens on that metal tip based on that feed. So I love to use those for that. And then we have customers that have very specific pieces of equipment and they want to know all that data. But I'm gonna tell you a secret. I run corrosion coupons even if I have those corrators, and again, that's the name brand, I can't think of the other thing, in the system because that allows me to utilize both sets of data to get more information about the system. Folks, I hope that this episode has made you think more about corrosion coupons. It is such an easy tool to use. Now you know the entire life of a corrosion coupon. So it's my hope that you're gonna start using these better. If you're not using them, you are gonna start using them. And when you send them in to either your lab or my lab or anybody like me, you are going to get better results because you now know why we need all that information. And the information that we give you is now going to make a little bit more sense. Now, the last question I'll answer is, what's the difference between all the different labs out there that you can send corrosion coupons to? And I'm going to tell you, all the labs out there are extremely good, but my preference is that I want a water treater on the other end who understands what to look for in corrosion coupons. So when a corrosion coupon comes back pitted or has something else on it, there's some sort of accelerated corrosion on it, we can ask questions of each other and you can get good data and good answers to your questions so you can now do something to affect that. I will tell you that nine times out of 10, Installation issues are what I see when corrosion coupon data does not come back proper. And I already mentioned it's not being installed in the system properly. It's not being uh, the right order in the system or not handled properly either when you install them or when you take them out of the system. So if you can do all of that and then work with somebody who you can get more than just a number from that corrosion coupon from, I know that corrosion coupons are going to make you a better water treater because you're going to have more data about that system. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this special corrosion coupon pinks and blues. Scoundrel Nation, I hear from so many people that they love going back to older episodes and re-listening. In fact, when I compare some of our statistics to other podcasters that I know, more people re-listen to Scaling Up H2O podcast than any other podcaster that I am associated with. And they're all jealous about that. But it's not me, it's just the material that we have. And let's face it, there's so much that we have to learn in industrial water treatment to have a resource like this podcast to re-listen whenever you want to bolster your knowledge on any particular topic how cool is that? And we have well over 300 episodes of content. So thank you for allowing me to replay this episode. I know you will get something out of it, even if you listen to it again. And I hope that the next time you look at that little guy, that little corrosion coupon, whatever metallurgy it may be, you now know his or her story. I don't know what gender corrosion coupons are. And you are going to treat them with a little bit more respect. And when you install them, you are thinking about the end result. And that will allow you to go through the entire process a lot better. And I promise that your program will be better for it. Something else you will be better for is if you listen to this brand new installment of Periodic Water Table with James. 
Hello and welcome to the Periodic Water Table with James, where we think and learn about water chemistry drop by drop. Please use your week to search online, ask your colleagues, or even pick up a book to learn more about each week's periodic water table topic. If you do, at the end of the year, you'll be 52 water chemistry smarter. So let's raise the water table of knowledge together and get started. Today's topic is... Bromine. Is bromine an oxidizing or non-oxidizing antimicrobial? What is its chemical formula and how does it differ from bromide? What are typical usage concentrations of bromine? How does it interact with microbes? How do you test for it? How quickly should you test for bromine after sampling? Should you test for free bromine, total bromine, or both? What is the impact of pH on bromine? Is bromine more effective than chlorine at higher pHs, or is the story a little more complex than the dissociation curves would indicate? How quickly does bromine act on unwanted microbiological activity? What methods are there for getting bromine chemistry into the water? Can bromine be overstabilized at times with some of these methods? If so, how likely is this to happen, and how would the system recover? How does ammonia interact with bromine, and is this a concern? What is bromine's impact upon corrosion? Remember, knowledge is power, and taking the time to learn more about water chemistry each week will help make you a force to be reckoned with. Be sure to post what you learned to social media and tag it with hashtag watertable23 and hashtag scalinguph2o. I look forward to learning more from you. Well, James, thank you once again for that installment of Periodic Water Table with James. I know so many people are keeping up each and every week with James's challenges, and we're learning each and every week. Now, maybe you've missed a week here or there, and if you have, just go back and listen to another episode, a previous episode, and we'll have all that information for you. And of course, we're keeping track of that on our show notes page. So you can go to scalinguph2o.com and we'll have all of the periodic water table with James's. Is that how you say that? I don't know which item you make plural when you say that title. Anyway, it will be on the webpage. And I have to say, our staff at Scaling Up H2O has done such an amazing job and they continue to try to figure out how they make the webpage better for you. And the whole point is we've got so much content out there. We want to make it easily accessible for you so you can learn more about this field. And when you learn more, you're going to do more and you're going to do things differently. And that is going to help us all with our mission. The mission here for this show is to raise the bar in the water treatment industry. We, of course, do that one water treater at a time. And that is you, that is all the members of the Scaling Up Nation. And I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Up H2O. We're going to have a brand new episode for you next Friday. Until then, have a great week, folks. 